Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It gives me great pleasure to welcome the prophet of tea, James Norwood Pratt. And today we're going to be discussing one of his new books, The New Tea Lover's Treasury, The Classic True Story of Tea. Everybody should get this book. This was such an interesting book in terms of its history, the context in which the history took place, and it makes it accessible to people that really don't understand it but enjoy tea. Even for people that do not drink tea, you will enjoy this book. James Norwood Pratt has also produced and written The Wine Bibers Bible and a brand new book called The Tea Dictionary. Ladies and gentlemen, the prophet of tea, James Norwood Pratt, welcome to its rainmaking time. Thank you, Kim. Thank you kindly. Tea is such a fascinating subject with a long and colorful history, and the tea trade has set the scene for a great many power struggles. Most of us have very little idea about the exciting world of tea, and even the politics of tea. Talk about it. Well, it's a very interesting history. The history became worldwide just 400 years ago this very year. That was the first time anybody outside of the Far East got a first taste of tea. So our European ancestors and the rest of the world outside of Asia has only really experienced tea for the past four centuries. By the time we had our first Tea had already been known for 4,000 years in China. Grace and Roy Fong. Yes. Really brought you a lot of secrets about tea and a lot of education about tea. Were they your mentors? Yes, you can certainly say that. My mentors and mentors to hundreds of others. Roy and Grace opened the first traditional Chinese tea house in, in North America. This would have been in 1993. What was it called? Imperial Tea Court. And you have an Imperial Tea Court up in San Francisco, don't you? Yes, that's the one I mean. uh, They opened their doors, this first tea house, about two blocks from where I live, right here on Russian Hill. How wonderful. That means you don't have to ride a car to work. Well, that's right. I, uh, I must have been the first person to come through their doors on the day they opened, which was July the 4th. And uh, I looked around and saw a cabinet full of teas that I never expected to see available for for sale in the the United States. I was amazed. And, of course, the two of them were amazed that there should be a round eye white boy like me, who had ever heard of these teas they had for sale. So we became fast friends on the spot. And I learned a lot, let me tell you. Did you find that you had to take up some Chinese to understand what they were saying or to understand and appreciate the nuances of the tea trade and drinking tea as a cultural ritual? Well, by the time I had spent hundreds and hundreds of hours sitting in the tea house with Grace and Roy drinking tea, I suppose I am an honorary Chinese. (laughs) One of the things that was very interesting, aside from the history, which I really want to talk to you about for audiences, was that chlorinated hard water ruins the taste and the aroma of tea, that the pH needs to be a certain specific type of pH, and that TDS, or total dissolved solids, are very important at a certain amount, less than 30 parts per million, is going to affect the way water infuses. I bet that's true with coffee, too. What do you think? Yes, it is true. It's true with coffee, soups, all kinds of things. You'd be amazed how much flavor hard water keeps you from uh, from registering. I did five shows on water because I've always felt there's a science to water that most of the public isn't aware of. That's how committed to understanding water I am. And I thought it was very interesting that this would be reflected in tea. Yes. Tea is the cup of tea I'm drinking right now is probably 98, 99% water, you see, and you can't, you can't have good tasting tea if you don't start off with good tasting water. How does water temperature relate to green or black teas? Now, I know in the book you said a lot of times over boiling it or even boiling it is not good for the tea. Explain that to us. Well, black tea takes 
boiling water. Bring the water to a boil. Don't let it keep boiling. Just bring it to a boil and then pour it over the black tea that you mean to make. You can use water like that, boiling water, to make other kinds of tea, pu'er, oolong, as well as black. When it comes to green tea, white tea, yellow tea, these more delicate ones, why boiling water is not what you want to use. Boiling water doesn't extract the tea from inside the leaf. It cooks the leaf, you see? Yes. So you have to use water that is about 30 degrees below boiling if it is a green tea that is very delicate. Kim, otherwise you're going to cook that leaf instead of instead of extracting the goodness from it. But what do we do with the type of teapots that are out there? How do we know how far to heat it? Well, I don't even make green tea in a teapot. I could make it in anything, actually. You use it in a gaiwan? In a gaiwan. Explain that to the public, what that is, Norwood. A gaiwan is older than a teapot. It is probably the oldest vessel for tea making that that we know anything about. It's Chinese, of course. And the name simply means covered cup. They have a saucer and a lid that goes over this cup. And the three always operate together. So you put your leaf directly into the cup. You pour your water directly onto it. And uh, you steep it right before your eyes here. It's the most intimate possible relationship, you see, with the leaf. It's not covered up out of sight in a teapot. It's in a cup right before you. And you stir it, and after a minute or so, you judge that it's ready to drink, and you can either pour it off out of the gaiwan into a pitcher or or some other cup, or you can drink directly from the gaiwan itself. It's both a steeping vessel and a drinking cup. And that's how I prefer to make my green and oolong teas. How do we get those guy ones? Do we buy them from you or order them from China or where do we get them? You can certainly email me and I will tell you where I get them. Uh, I'm not a merchant, you see. I'm just a writer. But uh, I think more and more tea houses and uh, tea suppliers, importers and so forth, uh, have guy ones for sale. So this is something that was unheard of before Roy Fong introduced me to it, and now the word has spread, and we're not the only ones who know how to pronounce it. <laughs> You're responsible for the great renaissance of tea in the United States. Well, I'm willing to take that responsibility. It's a responsibility I share with a great many others, but it's true that when I wrote my first book on tea, there hadn't been a serious treatment of the subject in 75 years. What led you to writing about tea? Is it you walking into that tea shop in San Francisco, or was it before that? No, it was before that. This book came out 10 years or more before I walked into that tea house in San Francisco. Uh, uh, I had written a book on wine, and I had promised my publisher a a follow-up book. And tea just appealed to me as the subject for my follow-up book, and it turned out that wine was the perfect training to understand tea. Once you know how to taste, you can taste wine, tea, or the soup that you're cooking, you see. You, you, you know what you, how to be attentive. You know how to look for the effect that it has on your taste. Well, not only that, but wine and tea are sisters under the skin. Both of these are agricultural products which, at their very best, aspire to becoming works of art. So you see, there are two things that mankind has produced over centuries and centuries of trial and error, which actually we could live without. We don't require wine or tea, either one, to sustain life. We just like the way it makes us feel and the way it tastes to us.